So now let me introduce uh, tonight's track. Okay, so the title for for this session would be uh, creating content for a wider audience. Yes, and uh, to introduce um, the moderator for the day, we have John Fu, a film producer, as well as can we see the the have Lenny slide, please? Yes, so we've got uh, Le, a filmmaker. I think he's uh, made a lot of um, films as well as a uh, series for HBO. I think we're very familiar with him. We've got Chris Gasman from the Philippines. So, hi, welcome. We're so happy that we have you here. And we also have Leon Cho, a filmmaker. And he was also our NIFA uh, award winning uh, filmmaker as well. And last but not least, we have Kenneth from Hummingbird. Well, unfortunately, Hui El, who was supposed to join us tonight, um, due to some unforeseen circumstance she couldn't but otherwise we still have Kenneth who will be sharing with us um, um, from uh, his content and a uh, business development point of view so without further ado I'm gonna hand over the time to Joan Joan uh, let's um, let's kick off the session hi hi good evening everybody um, good to be back at the National Youth Film Awards conference it's been fun um, we are going into the session on how do we access a wider audience. Um, I think very pertinent topic for us. Uh, we've also gotten um, a friend from the Philippines, Chris, you know, perhaps to also share with us, you know, some of the strategies and tactics for an online producer to actually access a wider audience on new platforms, um, you know, looking at the new norm with the pandemic and, and you know, so forth. Um, we're going to really, really just go into the discussions. Um, I think uh, all the filmmakers here uh, have works that actually speak for themselves and all of them have actually ventured forth to, you know, uh, ventured forth from the short film platform, you know, the traditional film platforms onto the online platform. So it'll be very exciting to hear from them. Um, keep those questions coming. Um, I think a lot of questions were about how do you start off as a filmmaker? How do you sustain yourself actually accessing uh, newer and wider audiences? Um, we won't guarantee that you will find the answers, but we can guarantee you that we'll give you something to think about. Um, so, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, just now, um, you know, welcome, Chris. You know, I think, uh, Chris, the production company that you have is, you know, such a significant name, Black Sheep from ABS-CBN. <laughs> um, pretty awesome stuff. Um, I would like you to perhaps uh, kick it off by perhaps introducing us um, Hello Stranger, which was a very big online content hit uh, in the Filipino community and also in the Philippines itself. Um, so yeah, maybe Chris, you could start off with you know, talking a bit about uh, Hello Stranger. All right. Thanks, Juan. Um, hi, everyone in Singapore. Uh, I'm in Manila, Philippines right now, and it's really my honor and pleasure to be joining all of you here. Uh, so, how, where do I start with Hello Stranger? Okay, uh, it, the, the idea for Hello Stranger really started when the Philippines, um, the government declared a lockdown. And because of that, we cannot shoot. So, we were still struggling about all the shooting protocols because, of course, the budget is going to blow up because of all the protocols, testing, and everything that's going to happen. So, we were thinking what's going to be the most cost-effective way that we can still engage our audience at this time. And side by side, while we were thinking about it, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the BL genre. So um, there was this Thai BL or Boys Love series called Together, and it was a massive hit in the Philippines. And we thought, why don't we do something that's very uniquely Filipino? Why don't we also do a BL series considering that we've seen that there's a huge following in the Philippines? So when we started with Hello Stranger, to be honest, we didn't expect the kind of reception and following that we'd be getting. So ever since we launched and up until now, we've been averaging for about 1.6 million views per episode. So we're just very, very proud and happy with what we did with Hello Stranger. Aside from aside from the boys love genre, which is kind of getting quite popular in a sense that it's it's kind of like a romantic comedy, but it has a bit of LGBT themes. But nonetheless, it's it's always very chirpy and 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 happy and you know melodramatic for that matter. Um, we were talking a bit about um how you actually sustain the production 
you know, mm-hmm. during the pandemic, I, I think that's that's worth a few, you know, minutes of talking about, you know, how did you actually plan and rehearse the talent, you know, all on Zoom, in fact. <laughs> yeah, um, so if you guys have seen Hello Stranger, we did it, I think 90% of the entire thing was shot via Zoom. And to be honest, when we were starting, it was a huge mess. <laughs> we really didn't know what we were doing. We were practicing, rehearsing over and over again. And um, the actors were actually shooting themselves. We were just giving them instructions via Zoom. So it was pretty fun because the actors themselves became their own cinematographers. So we will tell them where to put the lamp, how to light themselves. They're also their own production designers. So we have a production designer, Wami, and Wami just sent all the stuff to the actors and instructed them how to arrange the background so that it's going to be um, still in sync with their character. However, for our main characters, so the two leads of Hello Stranger, we had the cinematographer with them because, of course, their scenes were more important. So that was the part where they needed additional help. But mostly everything really, thanks to all our actors who were all very, very cooperative. So everything, we were just throwing instructions via Zoom, via chats and everything. So it was a bit of a mess at the beginning, but we learned how to pick it up and um, organize ourselves along the way. Did you did you manage to kind of like uh, track the the frequency of likes and and you know track maybe how uh, the content was actually received online? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, when we started, uh, we were actually the the metric that we were looking at is actually the concurrent live viewers because we launch our content every Wednesday night at uh, around um, 8 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. Um, so when we launch it, we wanted to follow because the concurrent viewers during that time will tell us like how many people are actually engaged and how many people are actually fans of this series that they will watch it on time at 8 p.m. And that was when we realized that from episode one up until the uh, final episode, it was an increasing trend. So we started with around, let's say, 11,000 concurrent viewers, and we ended at around 22,000. So we doubled the concurrent viewers, uh, the peak viewers during that time, watching all at the same time. And um, in terms of number of views, of course, the first episode is still the strongest. Mm -hmm. Um, It has... 0.5 0.5 million views as of now. But if you look at all the other episodes, the, the number of views are quite the same. They're not far from each other. So you, you know that a lot of people actually finished watching the series. Nice, nice. So, so actually, the series kind of benefited from the fact that it was kind of launched, you know, maybe during the pandemic, you feel, and, and people yeah. actually could actually watch it at home, you know, via, via you know, uh, online facilities and stuff like that. Most definitely, because, you know, cinemas are closed, so people are looking for many ways on how to entertain themselves, and people are just watching on digital platforms right now. So um, I think it was very, very good that we gave it for free um, on YouTube, because when that uh, happened, a lot of people can just access the content for free. So it was very, very easy to access, and I think um, because there was no price, there was no, it wasn't gated, uh, we had a lot of uh, people watching the series. So it really, really helped that we really it digitally do you do you think that the genre and the perhaps the subject matter being slightly sensitive and slightly non-traditional uh piqued people's curiosity to actually watch it online um actually one we were quite um how do i say this we were quite anxious at the beginning because the Philippines is still a very conservative country. So we didn't know how the general public is going to accept this content. However, we knew that number one, um, together, the Thai uh, BL series was very, very popular in the Philippines. So we knew that there was already a bigger market out there looking for this kind of content. And secondly, we believe that regardless if it's LGBT themed, a good story is a good story. That's what we really wanted to believe in as um, creators. So um, of course, I'm not going to lie. At the beginning, it really was just this BL community. There's a big BL community in the Philippines. We were very, very supportive to all the BL series and films that we um, release. So at the beginning, it was just the BL community was very passionate watching um, the content. But because it became so loud <laughs> in social media, a lot of the people followed after. So that was very, very interesting for us also. 
Nice, nice, nice. It's it's always good that there are alternative, you know, platforms. Uh, well, now they're not alternative platforms. They are the main platforms. Right. Uh, we open up, you know, uh, topics for, you know, expression and topics to be actually uh, uh, spotlighted on. Um, and I mean, this this is the this is the time where I kind of segue to to perhaps Leon Leon as the creator showrunner for people like us, which is a gay health themed uh, TV series. Uh, you see, I use the word TV, uh, you know, content series, right? Um, I, I think it's interesting to maybe shed light on that. So, you know, maybe Leon, you could actually introduce people like us. How did it, you know, get online and, you know, how has it been so far for, for you as a content creator? Sure. Um, and I think, I think we can definitely call it, uh, not TV, but I think we can call it um, episodic, like yeah. the episodic format. You know, it's 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 not like forty minutes. Sometimes it can be like five minutes. It can be ten minutes. It can be, uh, I think for Hollow Stranger, it's like twenty minutes, right? Roughly. So for yeah. me, um, you know, people like us was uh, about ten minutes per episode as well. And uh, just just a quick background about it. Um, the first season came out in twenty sixteen, and it is uh, co co developed with um, Action for AIDS Singapore. And so it was, they came to me with, you know, just a proposal on like, oh, let's do a, a dramatic um, series um, that will target like the gay community in Singapore. Um, and, uh, but also be educational at the same time, because, you know, Action for AIDS advocates and educates against um, uh, HIV discrimination and, you know, um, educates about like STI, um, like sexually transmitted infections and things like that. Uh, not just in the gay community, by the way, but also in all kinds of different communities like sex workers and, um, you know, heterosexual communities and stuff like that as well. Um, but this is, you know, a very specific project. And, um, and I think it was very obvious uh, just due to uh, content censorship uh, requirements that the show needed to be online. And um, personally, I'm, you know, I've always been making short films, but I've never really ventured into this episodic space before. So it's always, it's, it was quite an interesting um, experiment, I guess. Um, but of course, you know, I, I do watch TV. All of us watch TV ever since we were kids and we still do. Um, um, and and uh, it was, I guess, a really, I think the short um, episodic format, you know, 10 minutes, be 10 minutes or 20 minutes, it's a very good way to um, bridge uh, your your like career from short films which are you know about 10 minutes just one off 10 minutes but then you do now like 10 minute times six or 10 minute times eight or whatever um, you know and, and I think I found that to be the most um, educational in the sense like oh now I'm telling a large a slightly larger tapestry of stories more characters um, and really bigger themes as well that um, and then the fun thing is you know is that you know people would um, ship the characters right they were like fall in love with the characters and they want to like you know see them do well or, or don't want them to get like heartbroken or whatever mm -hmm. uh so that's always that's also quite interesting um and um but yeah you know the first season came out and we had no expectations we didn't really do any marketing but it did really well and uh i can't say we have like millions of views like like chris chris has showed us um but you know we went to a couple of uh red festivals and we got a couple of awards as well um and, Did you track and the, were you able to track the numbers and and see when it escalated in, in, in terms of uh, people like us um i mean i think the youtube statistics is probably available but i can't really recall what the ex, if there was an explosion by any means but okay. i do remember there was a particular time where it peaked um mm -hmm. you know or, or times where it peaked where you know we were featured on a couple of like articles or if there was um, an award or, um, uh, or how to say like some, I also noticed that some Singapore websites would say oh you know top five best web series to check out uh, that kind yeah. of stuff you know um, and and uh, that really helped uh, sort of the word of mouth yeah yeah would you would you say that um, perhaps the wider audience online actually kind of gave you that critical mass um, for, for people interested to say, hey, let's do a season two? Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. We, of course, didn't know what to expect uh, in terms of the response. Um, but secretly, of course, you know, we wish, we wish it the best success. Um, and with just the response to season one and how uh, it has uh, also helped its target audience, um, 
you know, just across the board in terms of like sexual health or even um, representation on screen because, you know, such images are basically not non-existent in Singapore. And um, so I, I think there was definitely a, a, a impetus to continue that and see where we can where we can go with, with a second season. And then eventually, yes, we, we did do a second season that released uh, in 2019. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say also that the second season was nominated for an inter international Emmy for short form series uh, last year. So that has been quite a surprise amidst the COVID doom and gloom. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, of course, you know, all these things are unexpected. You just submit and you just hope for the best. Uh, but um, it's really nice when, when, when you get um, this kind of recognition, not just from like awards, but like from the little comments that people post that, you know, they say like, oh, I really like your show or like, oh, thanks for making this show. Um, or like, oh, I really like this character, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's quite different from say the short film space where sometimes such feedback is uh, harder to get or um, not as immediate. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, go back to Chris. Uh, there's a question online that asks, where can we watch Hello Stranger? Chris. Oh, <laughs> it's available <laughs> on YouTube. So all they have to do is search Hello Stranger episode one. But if they want to watch it on Netflix, it's going to be out on Netflix by May 10. Awesome. Nice. Very cool. It's uh, what, six episode or how Eight long episodes. is it? Eight. Yeah. Okay. Eight episodes. Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Um, you okay. can also see people like us on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say that. I think people like us oh. also on YouTube. Uh, both seasons, if I'm not wrong, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Just search for people like us web series. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I feel that the, the online space also gives content creators that, that real avenue of interaction. Um, this is something that we'll probably revisit again. Uh, but as I, I'm going to echo what uh, Leon has mentioned whereby you can really see responses and you can see either heartfelt comments or you know, perhaps people dissing you, I'm not very sure, but it's immediate and from a content creator's perspective, uh, feedback to improve your craft is actually pretty important and, and that's something perhaps um, of a delayed reaction if you were to actually go, in it, go, go into traditional cinema or, or broadcast. Um, but cool, interesting. Um, we will hear more from, from Leon and Chris. Um, I'd like to turn the attention to NSF TV, uh, Hummingbird and Kenneth. Welcome, Kenneth. Um, mm. For those of you who are expecting Kweya, we 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 <laughs> unable to get Kweya, but I think Kenneth would be able to actually uh, give us also the entire spiel of uh, mm. the success stories of uh, NSF TV. Um, so maybe Kenneth, you will want to shortly introduce NSF TV to us. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, yeah, it's quite cool that you say that it's a success. But for us, uh, we're just barely starting. Uh, I think like uh, it's really it's going to be a very very exciting year for us uh, in twenty twenty one because we have a slew of like uh, really cool content coming up. But NSF TV basically um, started um, when um, actually we are associated to our parent. Uh, sister company, Little Red Ants as well. And it was a bunch of, uh, Little Red Ants are built with a bunch of creatives. And I think the founders were really interested in, in creating a platform that can bring value to audiences. So I think NSF TV basically started as really a test bit for uh, different kinds of content. So you would see um, strong young voices such as Ahuir uh, being the EP of um, NSF TV creating shows like Girls, Girls, Girls that really uh, touch on uh, female topics uh, uh, and it's targeted towards young females. And uh, we also use the NSF TV as an experimental platform to create stuff such as One Take uh, and mm -hmm. creating different kinds of uh, films as well to see how it would uh, react uh, towards uh, different kinds of audiences so that we could use uh, that data to feed back um, towards other productions as well. So I think this data ultimately um, helps um, LRA build, uh, Lil Ray Ends build a um, stronger creative voice also, but also it allows us to have that platform to con communicate to different sets of audiences and bring value to them. So I think what's most important about NSF TV is um, the value which we want to bring to people. And I think the focus for us very much is targeted towards that 18 to 35 range. Um, uh, towards young people who um, I think um, Leon shared as well that 
um, there are information that uh, that traditional media would not be able to um, partake in, uh, especially for broadcast or even for certain um, websites where there, there's age control and stuff like that. And I think like uh, what NSF TV does uh, in that space is also to bring in conversations that are a bit um, unsafe for traditional TV, but yet uh, we're not going in there to, to criticize or anything. Actually, if uh, anyone checks out our content, they'll realize that it's, it's, a, it's very empathetic in its tone, uh, but it tries to make statements and support young people as well. So uh, we're, we're basically very much driven by that purpose. It, it seems from, you know, from, from what you guys have been talking about, uh, the, the new online space uh, seems to be really, really for the things that are left unsaid, things that are not very well uh, uh, accepted in the, you know, in the norm. And these are the things that are actually opening up um, in terms of an avenue for, for filmmakers and content creators to actually flourish. Um, it, it's a fun segue for me because, um, you know, we are almost talking about and telling the stories of, you know, the invisible people, you know, nudge, nudge to, you know, Ler here. Um, Ler's the filmmaker and showrunner for Invisible Stories, uh, which is uh, one of the first few Singaporean produced HBO series. Um, I, I, I personally think that it was a very nice uh, uh, series to actually reflect on, you know, so-called the unseen stories of, you know, Singapore and also the immigrants. Um, I, I, I would like Le to maybe talk a bit about um, the perspective of accessing the wider audience because, I mean, Le being a filmmaker yourself, you've also made short films, The Drum, Paper House, and also dabbled in in the traditional TV series, right? Has, has this um, invisible story experience on HBO also proven that you can actually access a wider audience on an OTT streamer? Mm, uh, okay, I came, I came from a background of free-to-air TV, but uh, right now free-to-air doesn't mean anything anymore. <laughs> uh, so it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see how things grow from like, uh, like free to add and cable and now it's just everything is online uh, OTT. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I've always been doing the same thing, which is to tell stories. Uh, it's just, it's just uh, been changing, you know, like uh, the medium has changed, but the, the, the craft is um, thereabouts is the same. With regards to your question about the, the reach of the, of the, uh, of the show, um, it's quite amazing because, um, like, uh, with the internet, the reach is so much further. Um, like a show like uh, Invisible Stories can reach some, which is very Singaporean, very local, very small story, can reach someone at the other end of the globe because of HBO Max uh, network. So mm -hmm. um, we are able to tell our stories and share our cultures in a way whereby we previously couldn't. So this is a really... Um, uh, interesting and really positive development. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think it was one of the things that um, we are always very mindful of, you know, if, if you're talking about the wider audience is who are these people watching, right? And I think, you know, coming back to, you know, data and the metrics, uh, it seems that the online platform uh, would actually allow you to actually examine all this, you know, data and the metrics. And I mean, of course, at the face, at, at the first value is your likes and stuff like that. Um, what, what I would probably want to ask now is, um, you know, for content creators like yourselves, um, perhaps more geared towards uh, maybe Kenneth and, and maybe Chris, um, do you actively uh, calculate and, and strategize your content based on data and metrics? Or I mean, maybe Leon, if you want to add on, you know, uh, by all means. Okay, let me start on that. Um, as for us, uh, it's very, very important for us that at the beginning, we have a very solid vision uh, with what we want to do. So regardless of all the feedback and data that we get, you always have to be centered on that vision. Like, why are we passionate about doing this? Because a lot of times, if you're going to listen to all the feedback, it might derail you or it might put you off track with your original vision. So it, it always begins with you trusting your director, trusting the entire team that our vision is solid and we're all um, in this. 
However, um, feedback is very, very good um, in terms of letting us know what the people are appreciating and what they want more. So for example, we had an episode that was only about 13 minutes long and people got angry afterwards. And we were shocked. Like, why are you angry with a 13-minute episode if it's still a pretty solid episode? So apparently, people wanted longer episodes. So that's the, that was the reason why we stuck to 20 minutes per episode. So we were still listening to those kinds of feedback. Um, another, um, another in terms of data is how we promote or how we market the series because at first hello stranger is of course a boys love series so it's really targeted towards the lgbt community so we were looking at the statistics and we had like 70% males and 30% females watching hello stranger so we wanted to challenge ourselves how are we going to bring more females watching this content because we know that the gay community really is the one who's really pushing for this kind of content but if we want to tell this story to a broader market we have to be able to capture the females as well and we had to do a lot of pivots in terms of our marketing like making be making people you know believe that love is really for everyone that yes. you shouldn't be allergic to this kind of content you know that so we had to do a lot of those things we had to make um, the content uh, very open and accessible even to uh, people who are not members of the community. And uh, by episode 5 or 6, we already had the 50-50 share in terms of the market. So we were able to grow the female market with uh, our marketing communication. So that was how we use the tools like data and feedback. But again, we never ever use it to influence us in terms of where we're going to bring the story. Because we have a script at the beginning, we have a solid vision, so we try to stick to that as much as possible. But but you also kind of like uh, took the feedback to augment, like for example, extending the time because yes. they it was too short, right? Yes. But, but um, uh, were there any feedback that said, oh, you know, we, we don't like this character, can you kill them off or... <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There was this. Uh, the main character there had a girlfriend. So um, at the beginning, people really hated the girlfriend. Like, what is she doing here? And we were like, if we're gonna take out the girlfriend, then there's not gonna be any conflict, right, in the series. And it's not part of our vision. So we had to stick really to our guns. We know that the character is going to be very significant later on, especially in the movie because we knew that we were going to do a movie afterwards. That was also part of our vision. And we knew we needed that character for the movie. So we really had to stick to our original vision. And it all worked, <laughs> thankfully, in the end. <laughs> Kenneth, yeah. maybe you can talk a bit about um, the, your reliance on data. With, is, is it the same for NSF TV in augmenting, you know, um, um, certain preferences, you know, be it client or audience in your content? Yeah, I think it's super interesting uh, what uh, Chris as well as uh, Le spoke about when, uh, I, I think um, uh, when it comes to different platforms as well, um, it, they have different challenges and different sets of uh, data sets that you can use. So uh, in, in terms of Le, um, it would be on HBO and HBO Max and they would have um, that HBO audience or the marketing would solely very much be on HBO side and obviously uh, Le's side as well on how uh, he individually markets uh, that content uh, across to uh, on his social platforms and on it. I think um, because right now um, there, are, there are platforms and the most basic ones are your YouTube, your Facebook, as well as your Instagram. And uh, there are different sets of audiences actually within uh, those platforms. So uh, for NSF TV, we found a lot of success uh, basically on uh, Instagram as well. Uh, and Instagram, um, after Facebook took over, basically had uh, IGTV and stories and a, a lot more engaging tools for you to target different sets of people. Um, so for example, like other platforms, the other brands, they may be stronger at uh, Facebook targeting uh, uh, that 40 to 60 generation that are much more stronger within that platform. For us, actually, what was interesting was that our growth really started um, pretty much quite a lot on IG. And uh, if, um, if anyone's uh, kind of like familiar with IG as well, is that IG doesn't allow you to really do that much buys uh, like Facebook or YouTube, where you could basically buy um, your position within the platform uh, and basically bring up your views and bring yourself up the algorithm. For a place like IG, it really depends on um, content subscribership as well as um, 
you know, organic views uh, and people can share uh, as well as safe content within those platforms as well. So I think the IG space is so cool uh, for us because there's a lot more data for us to tabulate on that side also. So when it comes to um, people saving uh, your content, why are they actually saving in a collection? Uh, could we enhance and bring more value towards uh, those saves? So if you look at our our way to engage people on IG, we will actually create uh, different ways uh, to, to disseminate information. We are not just using films. Uh, we are also using uh, other ways such as uh, your graphics as well as um, different ways of communicating text posts uh, and different things uh, to, to further market our content. So we do have our films, uh, those are mainstays, but we have other ways and other strategies to push out. So uh, to echo what Chris said, yeah, uh, we do actually use that data to see, hey, uh, are, are, are the ways where we are marketing that content um, actually working? Uh, are we targeting the correct people? So we tend to adjust uh, the marketing accordingly. But in terms of content, um, usually, uh, as Chris mentioned, the purpose is the most important. Uh, we, we try not to deviate away from the purpose of that content. Um, we try to build um, very, very clear directions as to what we want to achieve with that content and we, and we move towards that. And I think the evaluation tends to happen afterwards when the series has it has its run. Um, we will evaluate and see actually what worked best, what was the drop off, why is there a drop off, and consistently there were people also commenting uh, on your stories as well, or commenting on the films as well. And we take those feedback um, to heart and we try and analyze those those feedback to to not say influence the way we write or produce the films, but uh, find find different ways to help us engage people better. Yeah, it it sounds as though there's a whole new ball game of strategizing and planning for your target audience when you're talking about uh, reaching a wider audience online. I, I want to ask you know the filmmakers here, Leon and and maybe Le, uh, did when when you guys are are you know writing your stories, um, it looks like now you got to really plan the strategy behind releasing the stories. I mean, anybody would like to comment on that? Or do you actually plan <laughs> when you're writing a story, you know, who, who's your target audience, you know, how do you actually get them to actually stick on your channel, you know? <laughs> I think, um, I mean, at first, I think, um, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, as, a, as, a, as a filmmaker, as the creative, um, when I'm not so involved per se with like the marketing side or the statistics side, but I do ask for the, about the statistics just to, just out of curiosity sake. Um, and, and actually, you know, for, for people like us, there's, there's really not that much marketing because there's either no time or no money for it. Um, so it's, it's, um, and also it's also of a very different purpose as well. Um, and a lot of it's word of mouth. Um, oh, oh, sorry. No, what are you going to say? Uh, I was, I was going to say for, I think for people like us, um, because of the issues driven and that, that call to action about, you know, you know, action for AIDS and stuff like that, the, the, the word of mouth was pretty strong, I would say, and it still kind of like goes on until today because, you know, I've seen the YouTube and, you know, people still comment about it and stuff like that. So there, there's a certain targeted longevity, I think that, you know, uh, your online content can actually provide. Yeah. Le, anything to say about, you know, these things? Uh, I don't really think about this. Think about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Basically, I, I mean, I, I do my job and then like the channel will do all the marketing stuff and things like that, which is quite interesting because, I mean, uh, when, I, when I was, I mean, I'm show running uh, Little Stories, one of the most major things that I learned is that I am actually expected to be part of the promo as well. Let's say like, how do you want to market your series? They actually consulted me on that. I'm like, shit, I don't know, man. But like, that's a good uh, thing. It's a good thing, man. <laughs> it's a good thing, yeah. But then I start to think about, you know, it's like, how do we market in something like Invisible Stories, which is, which is like not your usual come back home after work, let's sit down and chill and watch Invisible Stories kind of series. Uh, so so it, it was a challenge. It was a real challenge. I mean, we, I, yeah. I I I like to add. I mean, on on behalf of you know, Le and Invisible Stories, I think I think one thing that I've observed with all is 
is although um, it is not so-called readily available, but the behind the scenes and the featurette and the trailers that are on YouTube are actually quite uh, popular in trending. You know, and, and again, people will type in comments and say, oh, you know, I have to watch this. Oh, thanks for making this and stuff like that. And, and I thought that that's really something that is very, very powerful, that there is this immediate feedback channel that you can actually evaluate. And, and on top of that, the data that you can have um, 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 to, to kind of access and evaluate. So I, I think that really lends itself um, to so-called the entire new ball game about pivoting onto new platforms. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess Le being you know, the, the, the creator, maybe, yeah, now it's time that you have to be more uh, involved in strategizing and marketing, you know, future content. I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes. I think, it's, I, think it I, is have, I have much, yeah. to, le yeah, I have oh, much to learn from, from the others in this panel who, has, who actually um, sort of like thought of marketing, thought of uh, re uh, reacting to audience feedback and stuff like that. I didn't think of anything like that. I mean, I just kind of tell the story that I wanted to and I asked I did ask for feedback, but it's just like this selected group of people whom I always go to, whom I trust, like, whom I feel that represent um, um, people I respect uh, and, and I ask them for feedback. But mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the wider audience, I, I didn't really keep track on what was said. Yeah. Leon, you're saying something. Sorry. No, I was just going to add that um, I think it's very important for creators or, or directors to be involved in the, in the marketing process as well. Because some because what we do is also part of the the allure or the draw of the show, um, or you know fans who have been following our work, for example, um, and 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 what Le said is quite interesting. Where yes, Invisible Stories is not a show that you may immediately want to, you know, go home and and watch it. Uh, but don't get me wrong, I did, um, you know, uh, but you have to in a way sort of pitch it in a in a in a in a very specific. Uh, like message so that people will actually want to check it out um yeah but let me say i i don't know i know i know you always say that you know it's not a show that people will go home to watch but i i you know i firmly believe it's a show that um that that um singaporeans uh, singapore tv deserves like you know i've i've, I've had enough of like slush <laughs> you know from uh from like you know media corp and stuff so yeah I think I think uh, you know this is not an invisible stories love platform, <laughs> but you know I, I would like to add that um, it was very timely for invisible stories to come out because it was almost a bit after uh, Crazy Rich Asians the film, so I think there was a bit of uh, uh, rich rich people fatigue in the screen sphere and invisible invisible stories really gave that wait a minute, there are also other people around and their stories deserve to be told. So I think that timing also, you know, served a certain level of purpose. Um, I, I want to probably talk a bit about um, audience right now uh, to the panel. Um, you know, we talk about pivoting and new platforms um, and, and this, this session is about a, a wider audience. Um, I, I want to ask all the content creators here, do you think that, you know, it's, it's the same audience that watches uh, entertainment and and is a patron of you know arts and expression and sociology or do you think that you know new platforms actually open up newer audiences for your works anybody do you think you have attracted newer audiences through new platforms or do you think it's the same people but they're just watching it you know on a different platform Kenneth yeah, I think uh, super interesting what Leon and Le just shared because uh, primarily because I think when we talk about platforms and even its creators as well, um, it's a gray line, but we are all in different spaces. So uh, for example, such as what Le is actually doing, um, I would classify Le as more towards um, the more cinematic experience, that platform um, subscribership experience, your HBOs, your Netflix, and your, your Amazon and stuff like that. Um, they have a different set of audience and they have audiences who actually are ready to go back home and, and uh, actually save it onto a list or something and say they want to watch this tonight uh, with their partner and all that. And they actually put on the show and they immerse. 
uh, it's very different from uh, socials. When uh, you're jumping on social media, you might be commuting. Um, you wouldn't find a 60 minute uh, film on Instagram or Facebook uh, because um, not to say that it doesn't belong there, but the attention span developed for those platforms are just not, not for that. I think like a lot of like uh, when you go for courses that Google and Facebook are offering as well, um, just just take example for how, let's say, uh, the opening titles of like films that you see on Netflix and uh, HBO, right? Um, they immerse you, they, they bring you into the atmosphere, the mood is different. And people such as Facebook and um, uh, IG or, you know, other social platforms, they tell you, hey, five seconds, you need to get your audiences in within two seconds, show them something or start a conversation a certain way. Um, there are different sets of audiences there, but uh, what's really beautiful here is that um, you transition, um, when, when I say the, the thin gray line, uh, is, is that you're able to transition onto different platforms, such as, uh, I mean, Le, for example, if you go to Le right now and say, hey, can you make invisible stories for socials platform? Uh, I believe you would make a five minute short film that's extremely engaging on an IG or Facebook platform, but he would do it uh, starkly different from uh, a HBO and a one hour series. Uh, that, that would be the different way of how you could you would create your content. You would be so conscious as well in that, hey, I can't spend 30 seconds opening my five minute film. It, like, <laughs> but it's all black and text and people would just like, uh, just turn it off and you would see the drop off rate on your data to be really high as well. So I think, um, uh, and John, you mentioned something that, that was really cool is that, um, uh, people such as HBO and Netflix, they will cut out clips and target people on um, socials also. So even Netflix and HBO, uh, larger platforms, they also use socials to, to basically target people within 15 seconds or 30 seconds to retarget you to subscribe, uh, 9, $9.90 per month to actually watch the entire thing. So uh, there is actually value uh, in different sets of platforms. But uh, when you have uh, people like Chris who basically made it on socials, right? And then like platforms would go like, hey, I really want your content now on my, uh, on, my, uh, on my subscriber platform. And who knows, like if it does extremely well, Chris might be then commissioned to make uh, features or even many more seasons of his series on Netflix. So um, it does transition to different places, actually, um, the, the way um, we can use content to attract our audiences differently. Yeah, so, so super, super interesting there. So it, it's interesting to note, maybe maybe it's the, the form and the function getting in different audiences, not necessarily the same. I don't know. I mean, I, I remember, Chris, you just mentioned that, you know, the, um, you actually could balance, you know, the gender ratio, you know, within a few weeks of actually releasing that. So actually, yeah, maybe that that's also, I guess, interesting to note that, you know, yes, content can actually attract newer audiences online. Yeah, another thing also, John, that I'd like to add, uh, I don't know if it's the same with Singapore, but in the Philippines, we've been noticing that there are just a lot of digital communities online. And um, we've proven this because um, in Black Sheep, we've been doing a lot of films, even prior to Hello Stranger, right? So when we were doing a lot of films, we have this particular following already. So we know the type of people who want to watch our films. So these may be, you know, movie lovers, the cineasts and all that. But uh, when we tried doing series for um, Hello Stranger and targeted like the BL community, it's an additional audience that came in because we saw a spike in terms of our subscribers. And um, we have a sister company, Star Cinema, which also does films for a broader market. But um, what, we, what they did during the pandemic was they wanted to target the Wattpad market. So um, there are just a lot of different communities now. There are people who are just so passionate about BL, passionate about Wattpad, passionate about sports, passionate about Korean dramas and K-pops. And there's just a way of targeting all these uh, markets and make them become the profits of your content. So that's, um, I think, what we've been noticing so far. Um, some kinds of, there are really some certain content that appeal um, primarily to a particular market segment. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, just, just to add on to what uh, Chris has said as well is that, um, so for example, like we were talking about the distinctions of how different content work on different platforms. Uh, so for example, what Le has did uh, was uh, season one of Invisible Stories that work extremely well and season two is going to happen. What Chris has done uh, is that a feature is going to happen and Leon as well, season two coming and stuff like that. Um, so 
these are these are just responses towards your content that helps you expand uh, that uh, series or experience. But mm-hmm. for a channel such as NSF TV, it's uh, a bit different because um, we uh, in 2021, what we strive to create is actually consistency. So anyone who actually subscribes to the content and actually look through our feed or our content uh, has to have a level of like, uh, has that level of commitment towards our content. And we do have to keep that brand um, consistent as well. We do have to keep uh, the content as well as what we produce uh, consistent. So on our end, it's not so much season one, season two, but we are actually gradually just pacing it out across the year. Mm-hmm. So we, by the end of the year, we might have 10 episodes of this, 11 episodes of that, and 12 episodes of this, but they are all parked under different IPs that attract different sets of audiences. So mm-hmm. we do uh, actively try and target informational audiences, uh, educational audiences. We try to target provocational uh, audiences as well. So we do try and use different sets of storytelling to actually serve uh, different people uh, that subscribe to our platform. And ultimately, these different sets of IPs or different sets of shows actually help bring in more uh, other audiences as well. But uh, that being said, we are very, very focused towards uh, the youth uh, sort of like uh, genre. So we are actively only targeting 18 to 35 so that our content will always sit in that very targeted space. I'm, I'm hearing that um, NSF TV is like kind of like almost resetting the ground rules, right? You know, with certain levels of consistency, but still targeting, um, as you said, you know, little, little tribes of concern, you know, prov- provocative things, uh, social uh, 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 reliance things and stuff like that. Um, there, there's a question online um, from an attendee. Um, looks like it's, it's really related to kind of like the scale and scope of, of NSF TV. Um, is, is there a specific team for marketing in NSF TV or is it just Kenneth Lee? <laughs> uh, no, so uh, actually for us, right, uh, it's, we are, we're very geared towards, uh, I think the problem statement for us when approaching the platform was that we saw a lot of noise happening on, on social platforms. And I think sometimes it's very damaging uh, when it comes to cancel culture and all these things. So I think our team was very conscious about this on how to bring empathy as well as healthy conversations online. And uh, basically what we are geared towards doing, um, the content that we put out or our intent is always geared towards um, empathy. It's always geared towards uh, value that we can bring as well. So whenever we identify our content, uh, no matter how artistic we want to execute it, these two elements have to be there. And the way we market our things uh, are also diluted towards that too. Or, or I would say focus towards that two teams of uh, being empathetic as well as um, bringing value to young people. I think those are the two things that are very, very important. Uh, I myself come from a film background like you guys as well. I think like um, I'm so obsessed and indulgent when I was a younger filmmaker. So in terms of creating uh, short films as well as having ideas for features. And as I get a bit older, I do tend to realize that, hey, my content actually nobody really like uh, I don't have that many people resonating with it. And I think like uh, my struggle as uh, from that filmmaker background was to, to actually look for purpose and identify purpose. So I think when I was stepping onto a uh, platform such as NSF TV, uh, which is very purpose driven, then uh, the, the content creation basically aligns with that as well. So uh, it's, it's a different approach when it comes to um, a brand platform such as such as NSF TV that has more focused uh, goals versus uh, the other sort of content creation that basically targets different platforms as well. So, so I mean, do you have a marketing team or or is it really really just focused on business development and you know nothing else? <laughs> no, actually, actually, we do have a marketing team, and what we do basically. Uh, we, we identified also that actually a lot of brand content out there were very, very extremely tactical and a lot of brand content out there that, that were created for younger people were trying to guess what young people want. Yeah. And ultimately what turns up are people singing in videos and like you have just really loud things that are happening. It's just like older people guessing what young people want. So like um, ultimately what happened um, um, when that... Um, when, when people actually identify that their content are not really resonating with young people, it's due to um, them actually, uh, or, or creatives actually working for brands, 
creating for young people, uh, creating with brands actually for brands. So they would actually work with brands to, to sell the product rather than actually identify with young people. So what we do at NSFTV is that we partner with brands for young people. So whatever that we do is always get towards uh, purposeful content as well. Even when we work with brands is to, hey, how do we start a discussion that pertains to your brand, especially, um, you know, even if you're talking about stuff like beauty, how do we actually encourage people to feel more confident about themselves uh, and how does your product actually empower them to do so? So I think we want to, the, the whole idea of uh, empathy as well as uh, bringing value to young people is not lost as well whenever we partner with a brand. So it's it's more of a for for the consideration of the audience and then bringing the brand to suit them instead of the other way around, which is the very traditional way, I believe. Yeah. So even when brands approach us, I think with that set of consistent level of content that we're developing, they are actually approaching us because of what we have been producing so far as well. And I think uh, that helps us a lot uh, when it comes to working with brands who already align with our, our line of messaging. Okay, okay, interesting. It's it's really a really kind of like a all all ways of looking at content, you know, in a new perspective. Um, you know, there there's there are many questions um some of the attendees wrote while they were registering uh, about story, right? And Le also just mentioned also, you know, um as a creator, you know, you just have to concentrate on really really, you know, telling a good story. Um I like to maybe ask uh, the questions that were actually put on uh, when people were registering, right, uh, to the panel, right. Um, as a storyteller stepping out of school, what what are the first steps to take? Uh, I know it's a bit wide, but I think uh, you know I welcome all your interpretations uh, for this. After all, this is the National Youth Film Awards conference, so you know I think maybe very targeted at. Um, I guess the filmmakers, Le and maybe maybe Leon, you know, as a as a filmmaker that has just you know graduated out of school, what what are your first steps? Um, I think uh, I will focus on my craft, as in like uh, just just learning how to tell stories and trying to find my own voice as a filmmaker, um, probably from making short films and stuff like that. I mean. Um, they are worrying about other stuff. It's like trying to predict the stock market. I mean, it's just all, all those like, uh, I mean, you don't worry about those things you can't control. I mean, when you're just starting out, you just worry about being good at what you do and then you let, um, let uh, I mean, hopefully somebody will discover you. I think that that'll be my answer. Yeah, I think um, after I graduated, I still kept making short films, uh, you know, every couple of years. Um, but one thing I would also um, advise is to find something that you can make your money. Um, and most likely it will be a, a, a skill that like editing or um, maybe, maybe even operating the camera or stuff like that. Um, because most of the time directing is not something that will make you money immediately. Um, and it's harder to get into directing jobs immediately after school. Um, so beyond making your own projects, you have to also find other ways to make money. Um, and I also, you know, things I did would be like editing, um, producing as well. Um, I'm not really like super crazy about cameras, um, but you know, if you if you want me to do, if you want me to shoot your documentary, sure, I'll do it. Uh, but yeah, tech skills like that um, are quite helpful to also get to expand your network base um, and to start forming your crew for your next short film. Chris, is it is it the same in in the Philippines? And and you know when when a Filipino young graduate comes out, you know what what would you advise them to do? Um, I think uh, because the the film industry, you know, is just so huge, right? <laughs> there are just so many things that you can be um that you can specialize on. And the way the Philippine film industry works is that after graduation, people normally um apply and become apprentices of certain, uh -huh. you know, directors or um, cinematographers, editors, and all that. So um, the film industry is really built um, on apprenticeship, mentorship, and all of those things. And then um, in learning from the master, you know, there will come a time that the master is going to recommend you 
like I have this new cinematographer that I'd like you to work with. So that's how it normally is done in the Philippines. If you want to be a director, um, same with what Dion said, it's very, very difficult to land a directing gig right after graduation. But a lot of the people in the Philippines, what they do is they join a lot of our local film festivals because the local film festivals in the Philippines give grants in order mm-hmm. for them to be able to produce the film. So that's where we kind of like spot all these first-time directors who have potential street there. Nice. Interesting. Uh, we have many questions for... NSF TV. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna let Kenneth rest a bit. Um, we're gonna take um, actually yeah. You 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 have to be involved in the next question too. This is a very interesting question for, uh, Singlish and the use of Singlish online. I think uh, you know, this is something that we can actually spend hours talking about. Um, let me write. Let me take out the question. The Singapore accent for content. What do you think works best in terms of how the characters will speak to a wider audience? Uh, I mean, just to contextualize this for Chris, uh, we have a very weird uh, response to how we speak uh, on screen. So uh, sometimes the Singlish that we speak on screen can be a bit uh, affected. And uh, it's, it's a bit different from what we are actually speaking now. And sometimes the Singlish is grammatically incorrect. So we've had always, you know, discussions on what is the true authentic uh, uh, depiction on screen. Um, anybody would like to take that? Maybe, maybe Le. Uh, well, this is a, this is, this is something that pissed me off greatly. Yeah, this topic before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I, I came, I mean, I came from, I mean, I, I did TV all my life, and we had a lot of uh, restrictions, and uh, well, I mean, Singapore can only talk in like uh, English or Chinese or Malay or or, or I mean Tamil or something like that. It's just just official languages. We always try to homogenize everything and. Uh, I think right now we are actually suffering a bit of a blowback, a blowback, you know, it's like uh, we, we, if we had pushed Singlish and our unique culture back then, right, perhaps right now people like uh, beyond Singapore will actually really appreciate our culture and, and really recognize that as distinctly Singapore. And we will have something that is uh, an identity in our art, in our film that we can push out to international audience. Uh, so that is just something, just, just, just one of my, my thing. I mean, that being said, I mean, um, uh, I, it, usually different networks will have different language restrictions. Um, we just can't control that. We should still focus on just telling good stories with um, universal themes. Um, if it's a feature film, short film, or YouTube video, or something that don't require, don't subject you to this kind of restrictions, then I would say just, just uh, go where the character go. I mean, like uh, speak. I mean, like for example, if I am talking to my grandmother, I'll talk in Hokkien. If I'm talking to my mother, I'll talk in Chinese. And then if I'm talking to my friends, then you guys are speaking English. And uh, this is Singaporean to me, actually. And we should. I mean, we stop worrying about what what is uh, a Singlish or whatever. Start trying to just focus on the Singaporean uh, language. What What is authentic to the character? I believe. Yeah. Leon, Leon, did you have this? Uh, did you have this in mind when you were actually making your content? Like uh, people like us, did you like? Oh, okay, they must speak properly. They must speak grammatically correct, or what? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think um, authenticity is key, um, and uh, that's what really audiences crave for these days. Um, we don't want any cookie cutter nonsense anymore. Um, and when you are not authentic. Um, people can tell and that's when uh, you will lose your audience almost like that immediately. Uh, so the lingo has to be right, the accents has to be right and um, you know be it Singlish or dialects or whatever and and I think you know slowly Singapore um, like TV uh, broadcasters and even the government has realized that, uh, that 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 is actually what connects with people because um, that, that's their goal. They, they want to connect people. So I do think it has been a fallacy that we are so afraid of who we actually are and how we present ourselves to the world where 
even as a filmmaker myself, I'll be questioning, oh, well, what if people don't understand us? Or what if people um, don't get a particular uh, specific detail? Uh, and to, to that, I say, uh, that, but that's what people want, you know? And that's when, when, you're, so, when you're that detail, right? People crave for that, that authenticity. And um, to quote my, to quote Leonard Yip from, from my film school days, you know, culture is currency. Um, and sooner, the sooner you realize that, the better. Nice, nice. Um, we have more questions um, specific to Kenneth, actually. Uh, hi, Kenneth. Could you elaborate more on what are examples of the values NSF TV is providing for your audience? And can you also share any initial challenges the team had to face when you are building NSF TV? Hmm. Maybe I'll start on the initial uh, challenges first. Yeah. Uh, I think the initial challenges definitely was uh, trying uh, for any platform or brand as well is to find um, your identity uh, within um, the landscape of different platforms that are out there. So I, I think platforms uh, or brands uh, that that are sort of channels on, on all these social media. We are still quite young within that space. So it's to first like kind of identify the, the space uh, which uh, where we can sit. And I think uh, naturally NSFTV was created by, uh, by people such as uh, Hui Er as well as um, the previous um, creatives that were in their age range uh, that were fresh grads and stuff like that. And they were all very youth centric. Uh, they all thought about, hey, when they were younger, there weren't content such as uh, what NSF TV is developing that addressed uh, their concerns or related to them. So that was the first basis of why NSF TV was created was to address those topics as well. And uh, also traditional mainstream uh, television or even the bulk of YouTube content online all had a certain level of look when it comes to uh, just different companies or channels creating, for example, comedic content. Um, yeah, if they didn't put their their logos on onto their films, you you may not even know uh, who created that content. So I think for us was to be a very very unique um, presence in terms of style and visuals as well. So I think if you look back at what NSF TV created initially, it was uh, really fully charged on style and visuals and trying to be uh, extremely different until we felt more comfortable with the position uh, where we were in. Uh, which we developed uh, was the style as well as our messaging and our purpose of what we wanted to achieve within that channel. And that like kind of nicely leads to uh, the values as well as uh, the purpose that, uh, that the brand can bring uh, to younger audiences. Um, we believe that there's a lot of things that are taboo as well as there are a lot of things that are not discussed um, by mainstream media or even by uh, certain... Um, different kinds of platforms as well. They are not discussing important topics in detail. So for example, such as uh, Girls, Girls, Girls uh, that uh, Hoya created was talking about, you know, adolescence, uh, how do girls actually overcome adolescence? There were re really, um, I would say, very realistic conversations about even, uh, you know, like uh, menses and stuff like that, that usually would not be depicted on traditional mainstream television, but it was represented by very authentic uh, female characters on screen uh, that basically gave that performance uh, representing those situations really nicely within uh, girl settings and the kind of conversations that girls have. And ultimately, uh, even uh, for films such as, uh, film series such as Girls, 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 we did not just purely targeted girls. I think these conversations are great for guys to actually listen in and, and have that level of education and understanding as well. So I think uh, for us, we are very consistent, uh, as I mentioned earlier, towards being of value to young people, as well as um, basically um, being empathetic to uh, conversations as well. So those are our main drivers when it comes to values. I think values is such a huge bracket. I think we can tap on so, so much group values to drive uh, on, on the internet. But what we are very, very firm about on NSFTV is not to drive the wrong ones. To not actually push out content basically just to gain views. We are not there to, you know, like have have a girl bending down as a thumbnail for you to click onto those videos. Like we're not all about that. We are about uh, the subject, the purpose, as well as the empathy that we can bring uh, in our storytelling. 
it it sounds like NSF TV and and Hummingbird and of course uh, uh you know Little Red Ants you know um it, uh, you you guys are very methodical uh, and very focused in this new avenue of of uh, online content. I mean, from from what you've been sharing, uh, they are actually very calculated decisions to actually step up. You know, laying the foundation, making sure that there's empathy. You know, uh, uh, targeting the audience. It's it's really really likened to uh, certain strategies of narrow casting, which is uh, kind of like a new phrase uh, as you know the opposite of broadcasting. Um, you know, which probably I'll I'll just probably sum it up later. But um, we have more questions about uh, storytelling. Um, I, I would like to ask again, you know, everybody, uh, maybe Kenneth, you can take a break, but feel free if you want to add on. Uh, there's a question that says, that asks, you know, how would you actually get inspiration for your content and short films? Uh, but I would like to twist and elaborate it further to um, how do you actually balance uh, creating something that you want to say with uh, creating something for the audience? Okay, let me start. <laughs> to me, um, it always, always has to start with what you want to do. So, um, because you, you, you cannot possibly tell a story for an audience that you do not believe in. So that's what I, well, what, that's what I believe in as a filmmaker. Um, the director, the writer has to believe first in what they want to say. And then later on, see if, if this is something that's going to target just a small portion of the market or if it's going to target a wider market. But it always, 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 to me, has to start from the point of um, a passion, a, from, from a point of passion and from a point of vision from the filmmaker. Because otherwise, if it's just going to look like commissioned work for the audience, um, you can do it, yeah, but trust me, it's never going to end up well <laughs> in so the end. So do you actually do you actually know the target audience that you want to reach? Um well in Black Sheep, what we normally do is we start by looking at the content. So we we start by looking at the pitch of the director or the story itself. And then we kind of have a sense of which is the primary market that this story is going to target. So we also have a sense of can it be expanded? Is the director mm. going to be open to that? Or is the director very strict about his or her vision that I really just want to do this kind of story? So, of course, later on, um, when we decide that the budget is going to follow, <laughs> so the higher the risk, of course, of the content, um, the smaller the budget that we can give. So that's just how we kind of like play it. So, yeah. Mm. Le, how did you actually come up with indivisible stories? I mean, it looks like there's a extended development kind of period for the the nuggets of you know these stories that you actually put up. So you know, maybe you take us to how did you think of it in the first place? Okay, I mean, I live in Ichun and I walk my dog, so I see a lot of people around. Uh, that's pretty much the inspiration for <laughs> for invisible stories. <laughs> I mean. It's just my life. Um, the people I, I mean, just just down the corridor when I was living in Yishun, uh, uh, is is a uh, is a medium, you know, which is which which appeared in uh, episode two. I mean, my father is a taxi driver. I mean, it's just uh, just kind of everyday life kind of thing. It's just really uh, all all around us, but uh, somehow it's just miraculously escaped the, uh, our our whole filmmaking sphere. I mean, well, our whole TV sphere, yeah. Dion, for you, I mean, when you did People Like Us, was there, was there sort of like a story that was inside you that you wanted to tell and then this fitted the pitch or did you actually craft it from scratch based on the pitch? Um, I think it's half and half. Um, and I think I also echo Chris uh, as well, where like, um, yeah, you kind of have to start from something you're passionate about or some story that you that you're really excited about, because that's what's going to take you, you know, through the pain of um, production and pre-production and all that stuff. Uh, if you don't care about the story, forget about it. Like, you know, uh, you know, you, you spend years work, working on a feature film. It's like if you don't have the love for the story. Uh, yeah, this is no point. Um, so in terms of that, like um, also, you know, actually as creators or as filmmakers or as storytellers, we're always 
actually we are, we are you, you should realize that you're the first audience and you have to be entertained by your own thing as well. Um, and if you're not entertained by, by your own show, then, you know, who else is going to be entertained by it? You know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it took me a while to realize this actually. And I think a lot of uh, student filmmakers and if you're in the audience, like, you know, you, you, you kind of figure this out slowly, I suppose, but I don't know if this uh, short circuits you, but but uh, it's about <laughs> it's really about uh, trusting on in your own instincts and, and what you love and and hoping that people will will like uh, what you like. Um, with regards to people like us, you know, um, the I guess the cool thing about it is uh, is that also it's a show that um, we we that practically doesn't exist in Singapore, um, and and so I feel like there's always been a hunger for uh, LGBT stories or stories that. Uh, we, not, we don't know me here as kind of said like I think it's so important uh, to dig into these um, little uh, niches and because this, this is really what's special and not and it's not generic you see um, you know it's really a time where where we really have to dig deep and find inspiration from just what interests you um, and and I think just to answer your first question about like how do you find inspiration I think many many people find it in different ways but i think for filmmakers or storytellers we uh, you know you could sort of i guess self-analyze and see what your past uh, traumas are like or your past experiences are like or just what's around you yeah i mean les gave a really great example like just what your life is is also inspiration for a certain story yeah yeah mm. It's, it's always good to know, and I, I like what you actually coined. It's, it's a creative kind of instinct, and you have to trust it. Uh, but also to echo what uh, Le has mentioned, I think how you hone your creative instinct is to really hone your craft of storytelling, writing, directing, editing, being part of the industry and starting off. Um, I, I think that's uh, inevitable, you know, as an advice to, you know, uh, the youths that are involved in media nowadays. Um, Chris, we've got a lot of questions for Hello Stranger. <laughs> um, there are two specifically. Um, with the Hello Stranger series coming out in Netflix in May, will it be exactly the same as the one on YouTube or would there be additional scenes? That's one, right? Um, and from the same, uh, I believe from the same attendee or maybe not, uh, will there be a season two now that the movie is done? Uh, congrats on the movie, so beautiful. Um, and I mean, before you answer, I would say kudos. This is testimony to a very well thought out content that has been rolled out to gain the kind of audience and, and the universe is created. I mean, you have literally created the Hello Stranger cinematic universe. Wow. So kudos, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, John. So, yeah, uh, the, the Hello Stranger series coming in May um, on Netflix, it's exactly the same as it is on YouTube. So, there's no additional scene. However, uh, for the season two, I hope um, everybody understands that our actors were working on Hello Stranger uh, the entire last year from the series to the movie. So, much as we'd like to do season two now, our actors also want to do other projects as well. <laughs> Because they can't keep doing Hello Stranger forever. So I believe that there's going to be like the perfect timing when we finally have our second season. But we're really, really excited and planning for the second season as well. <laughs> nice. Is it Was it difficult to cast the actors for Hello Stranger? Considering that the Philippines was is still a, a bit conservative and a little hesitant to do LGBT roles. It interests uh, you up. To, to be quite honest, we were the ones who were very anxious at first in terms of casting because we didn't think that these actors would agree. But uh, when we finally talked to these actors, it, it really was no problem at all. Like they were so open and they were so excited to do it. And I think um, it, it's really, really, really thanks to the BL wave that happened because all these actors saw that, oh, okay, there's really a demand for this kind of content. And it's about time that, you know, they take risks in terms of the roles that they do. So it, to be honest, we were... We actually anticipated that casting actors would be very, very difficult because the question was right. Um, actors in the Philippines are still very, very conservative, but we didn't have any problems, thankfully, with Hello Stranger. 
is it is it now something is it um has it actually kind of like uh, anchored itself um like the thai series that it is the go-to you know boys love genre for asia then oh i don't know um it's quite um difficult to compare you know because <laughs> The Thai DLs are so up there, but you know we're trying our best, and I think um, the Philippines um, is really coming up with a lot of very, very good DL series that also the Thais are watching at the same time. So we're just very excited that you know finally after all these years there are these kinds of stories that are finally being told because like what you said. Uh, For how many years, right? There was no exposure. There was no chance for you to tell these kinds of stories on mainstream media. But because of um digital, because of YouTube and all these other platforms, now it's already free for all, and we've um been able to find out that there's really a huge market for it. Hmm. We have another question for uh for Kenneth. Um, I think everybody is interested to to hear of the you know. The goings on, you know, in terms of the structure, uh, with the parent company like LRA, what are the challenges that NSF TV faced, which they couldn't even with the support of LRA? Conversely, what type of support did LRA provide to NSF TV at the start, and how long did they get this support for? Wow, it's a bit of a mouthful, but I think I think the main thing would be, you know, how did how how did NSF TV Have the kind of support from from LRA, uh, you know, to sustain itself. Yeah. So actually, just to just to give a bit of context, uh, Little Red Ants is actually uh, the sister company of um, Hummingbird, uh, the Hummingbird Co, which uh, actually owns NSF TV. So um, what happened was that uh, basically Little Red Ants uh, expanded um, into the Hummingbird company, and uh, what Little Red Ants basically really provided. Um, The Hummingbird Company uh, and NSF TV at the start was really the technical expertise as well as the confidence, basically, to execute a channel such as NSF TV. So, uh, for people who don't know, Leo Red Ants, uh, they are basically a, a large uh, production house that creates like all the ads that are out there. They even do episodic content for brands sometimes. Um, it's very much servicing um, high profile to mid profile or sometimes even low profile clients. And the creatives uh, within uh, these production houses are really people that basically come from backgrounds uh, that Leon and Le come from, and Chris as well, where they are exceptionally uh, talented people who are very passionate about storytelling. But like Leon said, um, realistically, in uh, a nation with six million people, such as Singapore, uh, that to earn your keep, you have to actually work in places such as production houses. You have to work brand content and stuff like that. And I think like uh, what NSF TV basically benefited from was the the passionate sort of like uh, backdrop that we could rely on. Um, when we talk about test bidding or even reviewing scripts uh, or, or even stuff such as uh, getting inputs uh, on directing or inputs on basically how we could approach a certain series or content within our platform, there was always support from LRA in terms of that, uh, Leary and in terms of that, because there were so many. Uh, Passionate people within there who just give up their time to actually um, participate in what NSF TV is doing. So on the creative power sense, right, we are always very confident uh, in that sense. So whenever any brand approach us as well, uh, when it comes to brand content, we are never, uh, we never feel like, uh, we never feel not confident about executing anything because basically uh, the creatives from Leo Red Ends executed everything. Uh, before and what we can do is to take that knowledge uh, and map that knowledge back to uh, NSF TV and basically contribute that back to uh, different audiences as well as uh, brand clients as well. Mm. It's it's again about an active structure that you can fall back on and leave you know um, you guys with the I guess the comfort that you know you guys can focus on online content. Audience sourcing, you know, creating uh, uh, empathetic content, and then actually falling back on a, a production house structure when the time is needed. Uh, it's 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 a very good idea actually. It's it's uh, exactly exactly. Yeah. So uh, I think even for Hummingbird and SF TV as well, uh, we we do do our projects independently also. 
But in terms of larger scale projects, we have larger CUEs and all that. Um, we're able to then uh, bring on uh, our creative partners from LRA, the directors are extremely talented to come on board to basically then um, actually um, um, work with them to let out that passion that they always had towards storytelling also as they take their mind off of the other brand content and work towards um, either commission content or the, the original content that we have been creating. Yeah, I, I remember NSF TV and one of the very first ones, uh, this was even before I think uh, Hui Er joined was uh, Neighborhood Watch. If, if anybody remembers, this was a comedy series on uh, uh, vigilantes in Singapore, which, which was really, really hilarious. And yeah, kudos. So, to so that, that, that was actually uh, done uh, by the creator of uh, Average Guys when he moved to SCAC. So when he was yes, at yes. Um, the hummingbird, he created um, the average guys. Ah, uh, average guys. Uh, sorry, yes, sorry. Right. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. That was really, really good. <laughs> yeah. So that was really like the the test bathing stage uh, of what we were creating at the start. So you would see, um, in a way, I would like to say we mature from from that experience as well mm. to move towards more purposeful content. And uh, it was yeah, it was great like experience for for the company also. Mm. What I'm, what I'm actually hearing a lot is really that there has to be some kind of uh, structure and planning to actually engage this new norm of uh, the online creator, uh, uh, the, the online content. Um, I'm also hearing that um, this feedback that we have from you know online, uh, tracking the matrix and everything is very, very crucial for creatives to either augment or shape their content, you know, or to actually just get a a very very nice sounding board um and and i mean looks like this online content thing will will be here to stay to to give a run for traditional media like film and tv a bit of their money um i just want to kind of like um maybe summarize and sum up um you know looking at the time i think we've got five minutes left um i, I feel what we've been really really talking about is a very old term called narrow casting uh, which is the reverse of broadcasting, uh, which is really to find and develop targeted you know, audience uh, for your own content and to actually concentrate on that using tiered ways of strategy to build on you know, either your feedback or the community. Um, and looks like this is the way to go. Um, does anybody have any you know, last words or aspirations concerning creating content for the wider audience? Anybody want to conclude? Leon. Um, I, I would say, um, I, I think it's really the best time um, to be a creator. Like, you know, you have this platform where you can put stuff up quite easily um, and also use it to test your craft and stuff like that. So um, yeah, don't be afraid and just go forth and try things and make mistakes. Um, uh, and and or and then hope for some success. Yeah. Kenneth. Yeah, I think like uh, it is so so interesting because we are moving into a very disruptive phase of uh, filmmaking as well. I think uh, coming from backgrounds that that um, uh, Le and uh, basically Leon come from uh, from film school is that uh, you know the filmmaking grades of the past are really predicted that everyone would have a camera. In their pockets in, the, in uh, next time and everyone will be an author in terms of creating films and as Leon mentioned you know like it has never been a better time to actually create films because you it takes you five minutes to create uh, you know a, a YouTube account it takes you you know like it, you could easily share your films uh, nowadays and basically like Leon mentioned practice that craft and basically uh, move towards somewhere because I think people like Chris, Leon and Le they did not actually arrive at this point, uh, you know, like overnight, uh, if everyone actually noticed how they went to the gym uh, over the course of so many years, um, <laughs> it's crazy, it's crazy work. So I think it's also always like a testament to creators and filmmakers uh, like uh, Chris Le and, and uh, Leon is that um, they are still here because a lot of my, a lot of my, former classmates and all those people are not around anymore, right? They are, they are in other industries, but if you truly care and you truly love the medium, um, you would still be um, creating even today, whether money or not is involved. Well done. 
yeah, actually, actually, I actually want to add one more thing. Actually, Le and I started filmmaking at exactly the same time. Uh, oh, yeah. Sometimes when we're drunk, we, start, we, we talk about this. But, but Le and I actually started filmmaking at exactly the same time because we were we were classmates at the Objectives digital filmmaking class. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh 15, 20 years? I have no 20 idea. years ago. And, and, uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, you're, I mean, Kenneth, you're right. It's the gin that nobody sees, but... Uh, it's really the hard work. Um, I mean, Chris, you can definitely attest to this too, where um, you got to just put in the hours and just, you know, keep chipping at it and stuff like that and um, and then hope for the best. Yeah. Chris, I don't know how much you can round off and I don't know, Le, what else can you say from those? But yeah, I mean, give it a shot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. You just have to practice, to, to keep practicing your craft. But, you know, the topic is about reaching a wider audience, but I will really, really advise you guys not to think of the audience first. Think of your content first. Think of the story that you want to say. Make sure it's coming from a special place in your heart. And if it's going to be so good, the audience will definitely follow. So that's just our guiding principle for the longest time. Le? Uh, I, I definitely agree with uh, Chris. what Chris has just said. I mean... Um, there's this thing, I mean, this whole online thing, right? Uh, it also creates a kind of uh, echo chamber, like how like Google always shows you what you want, Facebook always shows you what you want, YouTube always shows you what you uh, like to watch and things like that. We are being fed um, the same thing uh, all the time. And there is, I mean, uh, I, I feel that this causes a very deep segregation in the global community. And we are, we are seeing it translated in real life, like uh, the left is becoming more left, the right is becoming more right. I think as storytellers in this uh, new modern age, um, perhaps a part of what we should do is to bridge this gap, um, tell the truth, take, take risks, um, navigate the gray area and the messy stuff that, uh, and, and resist falling into existing stereotypes. I think uh, we should tell stories that humanity needs yeah nice great okay over back to back to lingua i guess thank you very much guys wow thank you Ler, for that very memorable quote uh, you know very very nice uh, roundup uh, and i really appreciate uh, john for moderating this session as well i you know as i said in the background just listening to all you guys share all your very valuable anecdotes and um Oh, gosh, uh, it's been amazing. I'm so glad that we're recording this so we'll be able to publish this uh, uh, online so that we can, you know, we, we can uh, revisit it and if there are some points that we want to come back to, you can play it back. Um, but before we end, you know, I hope you as a filmmaker, you were inspired uh, um, by, by some of the talking points and that you will submit your short film to the National Youth Film Awards. The deadline is this month. Um, and don't go away. Uh, we just have a little survey that we would like you to do. If you don't mind, you know, um, please help us out here um, you may have already done that survey but we would like you to share what you think about this particular session uh, uh, unique to uh, creating content for the wider audience so it's bit.ly slash naifacon 2021 okay or if you have a mobile phone with you if you could just scan the, the, the QR code and uh, uh, put in your, your answers. We're just going to give you, you know, a short um, um, two, three minutes to do that if you can. And uh, yep. So if you could just help us uh, fill in the, the survey. And uh, of course, on that note, I really would like to thank um, all our panel speakers uh, tonight, Kenneth. Thank you for, for coming uh, on, uh, you know, to represent Hummingbird. I think we've shared so much about NSF TV and I think we've also come to realize that all the attendees are very curious uh, you know behind what goes on uh, thanks Leon uh, I think we've got some fans in the house as well you know about Singapore pride and uh, people like us uh, continue to fly our flag high uh, and thanks to uh, um, Le uh, I actually know Le from a very <laughs> from long ago as well and uh, thanks for showing us that um that grit and resilience and determination does pay off and i'm so proud to see your achievements now and i think uh yes on to greater heights and uh, thank you chris as well for joining and uh 
you have newfound fans here for a lot of the Singaporeans. Now we are very curious and we can't wait for the series to be on Netflix. Yes. Okay. So I trust that you would have been finishing up uh, your survey and uh, we just have a next slide to show, which is to submit your film to, to NIFA. So go to skip.sg slash NIFA. I think you can find a link on the chat. And to everyone that has joined us at NIFA conference, this wraps up our 2021 NIFA conference. We hope you had fun. Yay. We I did <laughs> and the team really enjoyed all of you. So thank you. And I'm going to leave you to enjoy the rest of the weekend. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.